Education and the way people educate shifts over time as the culture and needs of a city change. And sometimes that shift is the response to something going on in the world. We know that too well with the recent COVID-19 pandemic when teachers and students had to conduct school from their homes. Another example in history is leading up to World War II when there was a rise in people contracting tuberculosis. In response, open air schools were built to prevent and combat tuberculosis. Over time, those schools have closed, but many of the buildings still stand, and we actually have one here in Columbus. We sent architectural historian Jeff Darby over there to find out more about its history and how the building is being used today. We're on the north side of the city, on Neal Avenue, north of Ohio State University, in a neighborhood that's kind of tucked away that uh, not necessarily a lot of people know about. We're going to visit a really interesting school building. It's a property known as the Open Air School, that's its historic name, and we're going to find out just what's happened to it uh, in the recent past. Ben. Jeff, how you doing? Good to see you, Michael. Good to see you. Jeff, welcome. Thanks so much. So the open air school. Yes. What a, a wonderful place this is. Uh, the architecture on the exterior is wonderful. So tell me about the place. When was it built? How was it used? It was built in 1928 and it was called the open air school. It was a school that was built for kids that were predisposed to tuberculosis. And at the time they thought that kids needed plenty of fresh air, rest, and um, exercise in order to prevent them from getting tuberculosis. That was a real problem in the, in the early 20th century, wasn't it? It was. At its peak, uh, one in every seven deaths were from tuberculosis. Well, once you got farther into the 20th century and they figured out how to treat tuberculosis, I'm assuming it, it sort of lost that original purpose. In the 40s, uh, tuberculosis had pretty much uh, been eradicated, and so at that time they transitioned it to a, a school for kids with physical disabilities and also a neighborhood school. And it was that until the 70s um, when it became administrative offices for the school district. Okay, so they used it as offices, and then at some point you got interested in it. How did that come about? So when the, uh, the public schools come across a building that they no longer can use, it first goes to other schools in the area, universities, and they have the opportunity to buy it. If no one wants to buy it, then they take it to a public auction. So developers like Michael and I could go in and sit in a classroom at the public schools and, and bid on this school. So that's how this school came about, it was through a public auction. Well, based on what I've been seeing, a full parking lot, plenty of activity in the restaurant area, shops open, offices in use, it looks like you've made the right choice and, and redeveloped it in the right way. I'd love to see more of the building. Uh, yeah, we'd love to show you. This is the original hallway, and what you see on the walls as far as the brick and on the floor with the tile, this is all original. And the lockers, too. I lockers as well. That's great. We preserved all that. And this is restaurant seating, but it reminds me of the desks I used to sit at when I was in grade school. Yes, yeah, we tried to bring that in. I'm a little older than you guys, so it was, <laughs> it was not easy sitting. Right. And these, these actually used to be lockers along here, but we tried to figure out a way, how do we bring more people and activity into a hallway? And so we decided to bring seating out into the hallway. In this space right over here, the cafe used to be a play area. Before those windows were put in, it was all open, so it was just columns. The open air covered. concept, fresh exactly. air, sunlight, but, but sheltered from the rain, that sort of thing. That's right. I noticed too that, you know, this is so school-like still with, with the stencil, stencil words and numbers over the doorways. And those stencil numbers, um, we've changed the numbers, but the style is exactly yeah, what we found when we came in here. I'd like to show you one of the old classrooms, it's pretty cool. Let's have a look. Oh yeah, this is, this is one of those great spaces that I'm always hoping to see when I go to a historic building. So this is the lounge uh, that is done by Understory. Understory is a sister concept of Wolf's Ridge, which is located downtown. So they did a great job and it's a beautiful space in here. It really is. The, the exposed brick walls are all original. There yes. really wasn't any plaster on the walls to speak of. That's right. Yeah, this is one of four classrooms. There's two on this first floor and then two on the second. And you can see all these big windows, and that was in line with the concept of 
having as much sunlight, much open air and fresh air. And they also thought the cold air was important. So even in the winter, they would have all these windows open and the kids would be in Eskimo jackets. <laughs> and they thought that was important, but they, um, the floors had radiant heat, hot water running through the floors, and that kept the kids at least a little bit warmer. So um, this, this tenant design, designed the space in cooperation with you. When we first bought this building, we were trying to figure out what would be the best uses for each space. Mm -hmm. So we envisioned this being the bar and the lounge. Uh, we envisioned the space below being the restaurant. So when we found Wolf's Ridge and they were very interested in this space, they were able to come in and bring on their design team to help create this and actually make it come to life. Well, I know there's more to see. If you have other spaces you'd care to show me. Yeah. Let's go. Let's go show you. Lead the way. Jeff, welcome to the event space. Oh boy, another wonderful space. Big arch windows, this is great. Um, so it's an event space. What was it originally? This was originally the restroom. So there were pictures that we found back when it was the open air school. There, there were kids on cots in their Eskimo suits. And this is where they would come for nap time. Uh, the resting room, yes. but not the restroom. Gotcha. Exactly, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yep. And you can see out the window um, is the Ontangi River. And that was intentional. They, they built this school because they wanted it to be a, a spot where there'd be plenty of fresh air and not close to industry or other sources of pollution. And at the time, this was outside the city, so this was far, far away from where... Yeah, it was well outside, I'm mm -hmm. sure. And it looks like there's a deck outside. Is that accessible from this level? We call that the terrace, and we use it now for the event space, but they also used it back then as a play area for the kids. And you can still see the historic piping along the walls from as part of the heating system. I assume that's not operating right now. That's right, it's not. We, we have all new mechanical systems, and that was one of the heavy lifts we had to do as part oh, of the sure. renovation. Well, there must be other spaces we haven't seen yet. Yeah, let's go. All right. So another great space. We're in the basement, but clearly it was a, a, a busy space. And what was this? This was actually the cafeteria. So kids would come down these stairs and they would queue up in line along here to the serving windows that you can see at the end oh, of yeah, the Yeah, I can see the, the windows, space. right. And they're, well, it's kind of a cafeteria now because that's where you pick up your food. Correct, yeah, this is now the restaurant space uh, for understory. So all we're missing is the kids. That's right, that's right. And the best part is right through that door, uh, an amazing terrace. Yes, let's go have a look at that. I've, I've heard about that, I'd like to see it. Well, this is a special outdoor space, uh, and, it, and it's um, an original space for the building. Yes, it was one of the outdoor play areas. They called it the other terrace. And um, yeah, it looked very similar to this when we bought it. We've um, obviously done some improvements and cleaned it up, but this was very much an outdoor space overlooking the Olentangy River. Then you really get a sense of all the, the way all the different materials in the building were put together. The cut stone, the, the rough stone, the brick, the, the terracotta trim, it really is a kind of an architectural lesson as well. The style of architecture is Italian Renaissance Revival, and it's got some interesting characteristics. I'm sure you know many of them. One of my favorites is how the brickwork is intentionally off kilter, mm -hmm. and um, so that's all the brick on the outside is like that. They don't make buildings like, like this anymore, especially the back side of a building. It's, it's beautiful back here, and you're, you're only a block off High Street, but you feel like you're moved and much further off of High Street based on where, how close we are to the Olentangy Trail. Well, taking on a project like this must have had its scary moments now and then. Fortunately, there weren't too many major issues that came up during the construction of this process. It went smoothly uh, for a historic building of this nature. The building is very solid. As you can see with the brickwork, we didn't have to do much tuck pointing at all, if any, and the building was built very soundly. Like you said, a project like this was, was stressful at times, but uh, at the end of the day, to complete something like this and, and breathe new life into an old building and keep it going for hopefully another 100 years, it's very fulfilling for us. Well, it sounds like you've really, you, you really understand the importance of preserving historic places like this and how they communicate to the character of the community. It's a lot more work than something new out in the suburbs, but uh, it's, also, it's also more rewarding for just the reasons you've been citing. Yeah. So thanks so much for the tour. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you, it. Jeff. And, Thank you, uh, Jeff. Good luck in the future. Thank you.
Many times, education goes beyond the walls of institutions and sometimes involves teaching a greater ideal. For instance, in our nation's history, many minority groups have struggled to get the same education and services as others. In response, organizations have been created to advocate and provide representation for these groups. One of these organizations, the National Pan-Hellenic Council, was officially chartered in 1930 at Howard University in Washington, D.C. The NPHC was formed to represent black Greek letter organizations on college campuses around the country who were facing adversity. The council came to the Ohio State University not long after that and has been vital in engaging black students around community, service, and leadership. In 2022, the NPHC Plaza was dedicated behind Hale Hall on the OSU campus. Its purpose is to represent the nine historically black Greek letter organizations, and as one person stated, to be a physical display of Ohio State's commitment to every Buckeye while honoring black history, heritage, and tradition. Here's more on that story. This is the moment you have all been waiting for. Each organization will have the opportunity to share their monument with you all. Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. My name is Rayana Booth. I am a part of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Yo, baby! Yo, baby! Yo, Kappa! Kappa! My name is Devin Stith, and I was an initiate of the Zeta chapter of Kappa Alpha Psi Fraternity Incorporated. Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated. <laughs> Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated. As the monuments were revealed, I felt happiness, joy, excitement. I even know when we cut the ribbon. Three, two, one. I was like, we finally did it. It's here. Oh my goodness. I don't think I recognized how significant an MPHC Plaza was until the day of the unveiling. Before this plaza, the university didn't really have anything to recognize our organizations in this kind of way for the last who knows how many years. You know, for many years, African American people were not on predominantly white campuses. And when we had the opportunity to enroll, it was one thing to be able to go to class, eventually to be able to live in the residence hall. It was another thing to be able to find and build community on a college campus. The National Panhellenic Council was created on May 10th in 1930. The purpose of the council was to unify the historically black Greek letter organizations into one umbrella council to promote issues of mutual concern and consent. So the council, for example, will support scholarship, advocacy, housing on campus, Black students were not able to reside on campus until 1950. Voting rights, things that all of our organizations believe in and those things that are part of our programmatic thrust. So the National Panhandle Group is all these nine divine organizations from Alpha Phi Alpha all, right, all the way to the IOTAs, all these nine distinguished organizations being unified as a group where they put all their strengths together. At the onset, when NPHC organizations themselves were established, it was really about trying to build brotherhood and sisterhood and community on a campus that for many felt very lonely. The members were not only a part of the Greek letter community, but they were also members of activist groups here on campus, like the OSU 34, like the Black Student Union, the African Student Union, AYL, and so they would form these organizations in the midst of also having 
the D9 organizations as well so that they could advocate for issues specifically for black students on campus. What our students need is the exact same things that they needed 70 to 100 years ago, an opportunity to come to a place to get a wonderful education, but to also leave here with a strong set of friends and community members, but also to find ways to be grounded in principles around service and sisterhood and brotherhood. So when I think about NPHC and sororities and fraternities, they are really the place where students are able to build those connections. So the motto of the National Panhellenic Council is unanimity of thought and action. And that's just to say this is the space that we all come together regardless of the colors we wear or the models we say individually. We come together here because we recognize that we all have a collective goal to serve the greater community, to serve the black community, to create space for students on campus. Uh, so whenever we unite as the National Panhellenic Council, we're all joining together for one front to put on an even bigger initiative than we can do on our own. There was an undergraduate student, Rayana Booth, who put together a written plan. And she took this proposal and began to show it to people on campus and saying, we want a plaza. We want a plaza. And she showed it to administration and different people. And then Devin Stiff uh, joined in. They were doing things with the National Panhellenic Council. And then thankfully for people like Dr. Melissa Shivers, who took that plan and said, you know what? We're going to do this. And she took it to the president of the university and then the board and the trustees to say, we need to spend some money on this. And, and how do we carve out this footprint? One of the things I was very committed to was making sure that the students were the leaders of this project. We get to kind of work behind the scenes to make sure all the technical pieces and the magic happens, but really this was their initiative, this was their dream, and we really needed them to be in the forefront, and boy were they. Before this plaza was established, the main center for black students was the Hale Black Cultural Center and Museum that has a couple programmatic spaces for students and has many offerings such as tutoring, our Office of Diversity and Inclusion works out of there. But before the plaza, there was not much of a space for black students, especially our black Greek students, to be openly recognized, to have space, to have programming for them, to have an intentional area built out for the community. So this is the MPHC plaza made of nine organization that we call the Divine Nine. It is important for us to have a physical space because of visibility. It's okay to have some things where you know you showcase, but that doesn't stay there for long. It's not something everybody can come and see because it'll be gone maybe in a week or a month. Something that is particularly for us. So now when I walk on this university, I can go to a part where I can see identity of the National Panel Hub Council. So part of the mission with this plaza is to give people something to come back for and to give people something to say, this is what I remember when I was at Ohio State. This is what I was involved in. This is what meant something to me at this school. When the plaza was created, it really was a tangible and physical symbol of the presence of our, not only our organizations, but a very marginalized community for a great deal of time here at Ohio State. And so when you see the physical representation of a monument, it really helps to validate the presence. No, no, Kappa, Alpha, and it helps to tie the loop to say that, yes, even you have space here at The Ohio State University. The Ohio State University has been in operation since the 1870s. Not venture to say that it would be difficult to know exactly all the students that have passed through its doors. There are some notable alumni like golfer Jack Nicholas, actress Patricia Heaton, country star Dwight Yoakam, and going way back, Jesse Owens, the Olympian. One curious CBUS viewer wondered if there was a record of who the first African American student was. We were able to track down that info and he has a really great story. 
WOSU's Curious Seabus answers your questions about our region, its history, and its people. One curious viewer wrote in to ask, what do we know about the first African-American graduate of The Ohio State University? Well, it just so happens that 2022 marked the 130th anniversary of the first black student to graduate from OSU. His name was Sherman Hamlin Gus, and he graduated in 1892. Gus was part of the first generation of African Americans born after the Civil War. Many of them had new opportunities for education that their parents never had. Gus took full advantage of those opportunities and would go on to become a pioneer in the field of education. He started life in Middleport, Ohio, a small town on the banks of the Ohio River in Meigs County. The area was home to a community of working-class black families drawn in by the salt and coal mining industries. Gus likely attended an all-black primary school, but he graduated with honors from a white school. He and another black student were the first non-white students to graduate from Middleport High School. When Sherman Gust arrived on campus, Ohio State was a quaint land-grant university with just a handful of buildings on the outskirts of Columbus. Gus was one of 70 freshman undergraduates admitted in 1888. For comparison, the freshman class these days is well over 8,000 students. While Gus likely faced many challenges due to his race, the available archival evidence shows that he had a positive experience on campus. As a student in the Bachelor of Arts program, Gus took courses in Latin, Greek, English, math, and chemistry. Outside of class, he was an active member of one of the school's literary societies. The student directory indicates that Gus lived in the historically African-American neighborhood known as Bronzeville. Today, it's called King Lincoln Bronzeville. You might think that Gus was forced to live off campus because of his race, but that does not appear to be the case. Frederick Douglass Patterson, another black student and the first black OSU football player, is listed as living on campus in the Northern Dormitory at that same time. In later years, as segregation became more the norm, Ohio State was not immune to institutional bigotry. OSU track star and Olympic gold medal winner Jesse Owens was barred from living on campus in the 1930s, for example. In 1892, Gus was one of just six students to graduate with their Bachelor of Arts degree. It's hard to know if Gus encountered racism while attending OSU, but if he did, it did not sour him on the institution. He joined the Alumni Association and attended several class reunions over his lifetime. After graduation, Gus headed to West Virginia, where he would dedicate the rest of his professional life to education. He was a teacher and a school principal when high school education in the state was rare. In 1904, he joined the faculty of the West Virginia Colored Institute, a land-grant college created for African Americans in the 1890s. Today, that school is known as West Virginia State University. Sherman Hamlin Gus passed away in 1943 after nearly 40 years as a part of that college community, leaving a legacy as a pioneer in education. Do you have a question for Curious Bus? Head over to wosu.org slash curious to submit your idea. Vote on which question we should investigate next and see what we've covered so far. This collection is a collection of uh, videos and film loaned to us by the Columbus City School System. And what I love about these is that they are extinct formats that no longer exist, so we have to get them digitized to put them on our My History website. And this particular one that I'm holding is uh, a eight millimeter film of Fair Avenue School in 1969, and this is a, a summer project that they were working on. And we have videos from Fair Avenue and the Fifth Avenue School, taken in the late 60s, um, and there are things from uh, Halloween, Christmas celebrations, there's art projects that they're working on, playground footage, um, just really great images that I think uh, people that went to those schools will really appreciate. I also think that they're great because the, the teachers that are in the photographs and videos are no longer here with us, so I think it's great to see people can reminisce and, and remember their teachers. Everyone had that sort of favorite teacher that they remember, so I think it would be great for people that went to fair 
Bear Avenue or um, Fifth Avenue School to be able to look this up online and then see their classmates and their teachers. Um, this is a great collection of things that we've we've added to the to our collection of my history, and this is just a, a great selection, I think, of, of what we were able to get from them. Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on YouTube or ColumbusNeighborhoods.org. Plus, see our stories on the WOSU mobile app, and you can follow us on social media. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. You just need